great joy to be to be here this evening and to see you all and many of you who have come and who have joined us uh, for this midweek service. I uh, want to be especially grateful that if there are any uh, seekers, um, any among us who perhaps uh, maybe are feeling weakened in their faith or are reading in doubt, uh, perhaps occasioned by uh, maybe just growing up and having doubts about your own faith, I want to say you are very welcome to this midweek meeting. This is a place to come among God's people and to ask the questions that you might have, or even to hear them answered, uh, particularly from scripture. Again, uh, if there be any among us who perhaps are not a believer at all, uh, or maybe they are skeptical about hope, you know, about the whole Christian faith, again, I'd love to assure you that you're in the right place, that uh, we love you, um, and that this meeting really um, is convened for such uh, as you and such as us also to grow uh, all together in our faith. Uh, for the sake of uh, those who might be new and who might be joining us maybe for the very first time, my name is Harrison and I serve on the eldership at Grace Point Church, Kikuyu, uh, the courtesy of which uh, we are bringing to you this um, uh, live midweek service. The reason we do this introduction, like I said last week, is that you know we are real people um, and you can ask us questions that we have an accountability uh, to the membership at Grace Point. Um, we're not just loose people out there on the internet uh, without any accountability. You can hold us to account uh, for the things that we would be teaching here or in any other forum. Uh, the Lord is um, good and gracious to me. I am a sinner, uh, saved by grace. Uh, only by the merits of Christ do I have a hope for eternity. Perhaps it's also good to clear the air. Um, Ken, thank you for the introduction. It might also be just helpful to say that, yeah, we do not have all the answers. And I know the title and the subject is very inviting. And perhaps many of you might have seen this on a WhatsApp status or a post was shared with you somewhere in the group. And you thought, oh, yeah, this is it. This is the one session that I'm looking for. And all my questions are going to get answered. I think. Yeah, Sorry to disappoint, but we do not have all the answers, but we can show you and we can point you in the right direction. We can point you to the source. We can show you the direction where all the answers may be found. Um, and again, also to acknowledge the limitations of time. Although technology is amazing, that we're able to meet and gather our long distances like we are doing tonight. Uh, this is wonderful. We can have an online meeting. Uh, certainly the limitations of 30, 40 minutes uh, also means that we might not be able to address every, every single area. However, these are subjects for which we need to be engaging more and more, perhaps writing, maybe even sharing um, sources or sharing articles online uh, for our own benefit and for our good. Maybe um, um, Desiring God to talk might be a good place. Uh, if I don't say uh, a lot of things tonight and you want to pick uh, some of these things and uh, dig up a little bit more, um, Desiring God to talk, John Piper's uh, blog, would be a good place that I could point you to. And God Questions, which is another Christian ministry, just got that, GodQuestions.org, G-O-T, uh, GodQuestions.org, um, would also be another place to, to look up and you, you're likely to find good resources that uh, would also be helpful. Having said that, let's then come to the question um, for this evening. Is there only one way to God or do all regions lead to the same God? It's a very, very big question there to, to be dealing with tonight. Is there only one way to God? Wouldn't it be very arrogant for anyone to say that, um, there is only one way, and everyone else is lost. So it's a big question, and uh, we trust that the Lord is going to help us as we unpack it, particularly from a Christian evangelical point of view. Let me start off by asking perhaps that second question. Do all religions lead to the same God? And maybe one, uh, one way of um, dealing with that might be to ask you a question, wherever you are. How many routes are there to get up Mount Kenya? It would be an interesting question to ask the person who is, if you're watching this with someone, 
kuna njia ngapi za ku, ku kwea mlima Kenya uh, it's not a political question so i know many of you might uh, want to answer it from a political point of view uh, but no just from a very geographical point of view how many routes are there up mount kenya uh, i think the routes can be very 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 many um, particularly if um, you think of mount kenya as an apex uh, right up one of the uh, you know one of the topmost uh, peaks if you think of it as just a very you know singular point then you could almost say that there can be as many as 360 degrees really all the way around the mountain but actually there are there are about seven official routes um, as you can see on that image that Ken has very kindly projected on the screen there are about um, you know seven routes you you can go up mount kenya through naromoru you you can go through the bugret route you can go through the sirimon more towards uh, meru uh, you can also go up uh, through timau route there is another one in meru town itself there is another one further down in uh, shogoria and there is even kamweti uh, which is in uh, kirinyaga these are kind of the official routes of going up mount kenya it's an amazing trip perhaps that Uh, some of us uh, should uh, aim to do at one point but but clearly you can also make up routes you know if you live anywhere near the forest you can also decide uh, that you're going to sort of make your way and just begin walking up the mountain perhaps you know avoiding the rivers and um, you know avoiding the bamboo plantations or um you know whatever you know obstacles you might face there there might eventually actually be a way in which you might be able to find yourself up on the mountain there can be as many routes that's what i want to say as there are people and some people have sometimes theorized that maybe regions are just different ways up a mountain that you know there is one mountain who seems to be god we do not know the way no one seems to claim that this is the only route um there can be alternative routes as well to go up this particular mountain but what you want to suggest to us that analogy of a mountain is actually wrong so sometimes it is comparing um you know an equal or things that are not actually comparable i think in grammar someone might say that you're comparing apples with oranges although both of them you know might be said thinking about fruits they are both round they are actually quite different perhaps in the areas in which they grow uh, although they are, they may be said to be both fruits their tastes would be different maybe even um their nutritional values might actually be different i was thinking about that earlier on in the day and thinking actually if if you think of a goat and a car you you can actually also compare them because you can say both have four legs in a sense and they actually use those they move on all fours We could also argue that they actually also have two pairs of eyes um you know the car has headlights and, and a goat also has two eyes and so you know there, there can be some sort of a comparison there or you might even talk about their ears and and maybe the you know rear view mirror but that kind of comparison doesn't seem to be a very intelligent kind of comparison because they are two very very different um you know items that you're comparing and we will soon see that come however as you would see perhaps from the next slide some people tend to imagine that maybe all religions are somewhat the same and they say that maybe all religions are trying to aim for peace and justice in the world when you think of um say buddhism just inner peace and quietness and making peace with oneself and perhaps also seeking justice in in the world and so from a very general outward kind of look one might actually say that maybe the actually all religions seem to be you know pushing in the same for the same goal one might could also say that you know all religions seem to have an aspect of reward of good and a judgment of evil There seems to be a distinction that um all religion want us to actually do good and be rewarded for it 
And actually, when we do not uh, do good, then there will be judgment. There will be uh, consequences for any evil actions that one might actually do. And so, you know, all religions might have an aspect of that. Again, you know, in most religions, particularly all the major religions, there will be a promise of eternal life or, or some sort of a, a nirvana in Hinduism or some sort of, a, um, you know, some sort of a heaven. Um, Paradiso, it might be called, um, you know, or some sort of a reward that will come at the end of this life. And also, some would say, in particular in comparative religion studies, that there is some sort of a mediator. When you think of our own African traditional religions, there will be some sort of a mediator, whether that would be um, perhaps a prophet, or that might well be the elders, uh, who might gather around a tree or near a lake. Um, almost all religions seem to have some sort of a, a go between who then sort of connects you or uh, becomes the pathway between you and the deity or about between you and God. I think that is as far as the similarities go. And like I say, uh, surely they have different, um, uh, if you begin looking at them a bit more closely, you you will see different moral codes, different views of humanity, um, different means of salvation, um, particularly as uh, in other religions would almost always be advocating for a religion that's based on work and human effort. And it will be very, very different uh, from the God of the Bible, as I hope to show us uh, over the next uh, 20 or so minutes. And so this evening, really, um, I just want us to spend a bit more, a little bit more critically. And actually, first of all, I found that almost all of us, in the last week we said uh, that quote um, uh, from BT, that Africans are quite religious, and, you know, and the idea of God is, is a given. It is indeed assumed we are, uh, I think he said, hopelessly religious people. But I'd love to extrapolate that idea and actually say it's not just Africans, but it is all of humanity. We all are somewhat religious. We are those who will try, sometimes grope in darkness and try and see if we can find our way towards God. And I would love to submit to us that perhaps is the root cause of all religion and of trying to to look for God, trying to seek him out, trying to, to connect to something that's actually higher than ourselves. And maybe it would be good to turn to the scriptures and just to, to look at the very root cause um, of this. And we find that in the book of Genesis chapter 11. I'd love for you to come with me then to Genesis chapter 11. Uh, we're going to read verses one to nine, and we'll also then turn to, uh, to the next uh, uh, chapter and read verses one to nine also. Genesis chapter 11 is a well-known story. It's the story of the Tower of Babel. Let's read quickly, and it says, now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shina and settled there. And they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Then they say, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city, the tower, which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, behold, they are one people. And they, all, and they have all one language. This is only the beginning of what they will do, and nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down there and confuse their language so that they, not, they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there over, all, over the face of all the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there, the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. It's a short story, 
very well-known story. Artists have also tried to uh, give some impression of what um, this city might look like. Um, and, and you can see in that image up on the screen, you know, we have these sort of uh, cities that uh, seem to be going up a spiral way, like a staircase that seems to go to heaven. It's a famous story, the Tower of Babel. You know, everyone is speaking the same language. But, you know, as, as perhaps a few of you might appreciate, this is like the culmination of all the rebellion that we have been, you know, and all the brokenness that we've been reading about from Genesis chapter three, it seems to find its climax here, where all the people now gather, and now they actually decide uh, they're going to be in one place. They find a place in the land of Shina, we are told, and they settle there. And they say to one another, Let, let's, um, you know, let's make bricks and let's burn them thoroughly. You know, and so we are told they had bricks for stone and bitumen for mortar. What's their purpose? Well, let's build ourselves a city and a tower. We want it to stop in the heavens. Why are we building a city? We want to make a name for ourselves. Why? Lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. We want to be one. They want a city for themselves, a dwelling place. They want to remain as one people. They want a dwelling place for themselves uh, in one place. They don't want to be scattered over the face of the whole earth. And the result of that then is judgment. Um, this city, which they are building, seems to have its tower in the heavens. Really, it's so small, the Lord needs to come down to see it, we are told. Um, you know, you know, and, and of course, with their evil intent, um, they will pursue this uh, uh, false idea to its extreme end, to which then the Lord comes down, disperses them from there over the face of all the earth. And the result is judgment, and they are confused in language. Why is it a judgment? Because um, God's command was for mankind to be scattered, to occupy all of the earth, but the people's agenda here, really, um, they do not want to be dispersed. They want to have um, a tower and a city for themselves. Quite clearly, and many commentators would say that this appears to have been um, an as kind of a, a city and a pillar that was going up. And these kind of buildings, archeologists would call them um, ziggurats. They were built all over the uh, sort of, um, Egypt and, and into the, the Middle East. And there would have been places of worship uh, where people then um, would, be, would be calling them like a stairway to heaven. This would have been worship kind of places where people are trying to ascend and to get to God. But uh, clearly, as a result of that, uh, of this attempt to build a name for themselves uh, and in order for them not to be scattered, their idea is frustrated. Can I say that even before I move on to Genesis 12, 1 through 9, that actually here is a human effort to reach to God. Here in Genesis, we see um, almost um, a face of rebellion. God has told you to scatter and occupy the whole earth, but actually we're going to gather. And instead of finding their name and blessing in God, no, let us make a name for ourselves. Now come with me to Genesis 12. We can read verses one to nine. It's quite striking how uh, Moses, the writer of this book, actually puts these two chapters uh, next to one another. Please notice who is speaking in 12 and uh, contrast with who is speaking in 11. 12 verse one. Now the Lord said to Abraham, Go from the country, from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land I will show you. I will make of you a great nation. Now I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him. And Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered and the people that they had acquired in Haran, 
And they set out to go to the land of, the land of Canaan. When they came to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place at Shechem, to the oak at Mori. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abraham and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he moved to the hill country on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and I on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. And Abraham journeyed on, still going towards the Negev. Two stories, side by side, very, very striking, and perhaps the key to answering our question for this evening. On the one hand, actually, you have man's initiative. Uh, Kenny, if you can give us the next slide. In Genesis 11, you see a man or men coming together to have an initiative. We are told, now the whole earth had one language and the same words, and as people migrated to the east, they find a plane, you know, and then they say to one another, come, it is their own initiative. Let us do this. Let's make ourselves something. Let's preserve our heritage. And so let's build, you know, something that will go up to the heavens. Essentially, like I said earlier on, let us make our way towards God. But contrast that with the uh, Chapter 12, verse 1, who is speaking, 12, 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land I will show you. Quite striking, in chapter 11, people are trying to gather. In chapter 12, you know, what God is saying to Abraham, go. Would you notice that actually the, you know, the imperative right there in verse 1 is go, whereas the imperative in uh, verse 2 of you know, chapter 11 is come. So come, let us make a city. Whereas in chapter 12, the instruction is go. The instruction for God's people almost always has been go. Whereas these guys are trying to sort of secure their heritage and their name, in chapter 12, what we see is God is actually glorifying his name by sending Abraham, Abraham to go. The other big difference that you will notice in chapter 11 and chapter 12 is that chapter 11 seems to be ascetic. As if you can excuse the big word there. Ascetic as in it is kind of trying to ascend to God, to where God dwells. Heaven's the dwelling place of God. But as actually in chapter 12, God is immanent. He comes. And can I suggest to us that actually the biggest difference between world regions and actually man-made regions and the God of the Bible, Yahweh, is that region is man's attempt to get to God. Whereas the gospel or the God of the Bible really is a God who comes to us aware that we could not, in any way, or by our own effort, be able to reach to him. Which is one significant difference that you will notice that, you know, the aspect of grace, that is God acting on behalf of man, is entirely lacking in all human religions. It is only in the gospel that you see a God who loves and a God who acts on your behalf. You will notice this, the concept of grace is lacking almost all religions. I do not know of any, I could perhaps be informed. Now, of course, you know, my, my research into this is obviously limited, but all world religions, any comparative study, African traditional religions, they are almost always a salvation of works. It is only in the gospel that we see a God who comes to you, a God who is immanent. You know, those, that amazing word, Emmanuel, God with us. He's not a God who is far away and cannot be read, uh, who is totally beyond human experience, who cannot relate to human pain and suffering. The God of world regions is out there. He is um, uh, difficult to conceptualize. He cannot 
um, be experienced in any way or form and has not been experienced in any way or form by human beings. You know, he might even be said to be abstract um, because he is difficult to know or define. But as the God of the Bible has actually been immanent, you know, he has come. We have seen his glory, say the apostles, the one and the only. Grace and truth is found in him. And we know that witness, and we'll perhaps later Ron read those words where Paul say, where Peter says that this is not a figment of our imagination. We have seen him, we have touched him, we have seen him face to face through the person of Jesus Christ. In chapter 11, you will notice there is a, an effort at self-preservation. You know, let's preserve our culture. Let's preserve our heritage. Let's preserve our name. Let's preserve our identity. We don't want to be lost among, you know, whatever else is going on in the world. Let us, let us do that. You know, look, look, at, uh, you know, look at the question they have at B of verse 4. Lest we be dispersed over the face of the earth. We do not want to do that. Come, let's build a city. Let's make a name for ourselves. The striking thing you will notice is that, you know, the God of the Bible is not about preserving, you know, you know anyone's sort of um, racial uh, or even tribal or even communal identity. In fact, on the contrary, he is actually dispersing. He's saying to Abraham, go from your country and your kindred, move away from your people, move away even from your father's house and go to the land. I will show you. And he's a, he's, a, he's a missional God who is actually sending him away to actually go. Why is this? Because the purpose here is not to preserve a human being's identity, but actually God's glory, which will be seen in God's blessing. So whereas these people in chapter 11 are trying to seek their own blessing, actually, Abraham is going to be blessed. He's going to be given a name. Blessing comes from God. Whereas in 11, people are seeking what might be quote-unquote blessing to preserve a name and to build a city, to have a land, to find land. Actually in 12, these blessings, so to speak, you know, having an, you know, a land I will show you, making you a father of a great nation, giving you people, and even making your name great, that is blessing you, and even protecting you, blessing those who bless you, anyone who dishonors you, being cursed. These are all blessings that are flowing from God. ATR, on the other hand, including our own, my own Gekoya tradition of cultures, makes an effort to be blessed. How many in this meeting tonight have trooped to your parents and to your in-laws and, uh, and to your relatives to get blessing or to try and acquire blessing? I don't want to judge you very harshly, but that's just how human cultures and religions work. You try to find your own blessing. You fight for it. You call all your friends and you buy a lot of things. You take shopping in order to get blessing. You are building a city and a name for yourself. You are trying to secure your lot or your heritage through the region. It might just be the tradition of the region. Or it might well be um, perhaps another deity that maybe um, your, your tribal um, religion. Almost all human religions seek to secure blessing on themselves. The God of the Bible, you know, unleashes and actually just releases his blessing by grace to a man who had not even spoken or even prayed for it, to a man that, you know, just appeared, a man who actually, whose descent was actually from the same people really who are moon worshippers, but God appears to him and shows him his grace and goodness. The result really is that in chapter 11, Today, if you have just joined us in the middle of this sharing, we are dealing with the question whether all religions lead to the same God. And we are seeing some stark differences here between human effort, that is religion, and the God of the Bible. And we are comparing Genesis 11 and 12. 
And what we are noticing here, the last point there, number five, is that the effort of man to get to God results in judgment. Results in judgment. God comes to judge. You know, he knows that this effort will not lead to any good. He knows that any effort at uh, self-preservation, man will only lead to his ruin. It won't lead to any um, lasting fruit. And so as a result of that, God in an act of judgment disperses them from there and actually um, confuses their languages. They no longer can speak as one. The result, however, in chapter 12 is the blessing of God. You know, um, you know, whereas these people are kind of scattered over the face of the earth, we see movement in chapter 12, but this movement is a movement of blessing. They are moving, he's moving from one place. The Lord is appearing to him. The Lord is assuring him in verse 7 to your offspring, I will give this land. He builds an altar there, you know, and he calls upon the name of the Lord. He moves on from there. He moved on to the hill country on the east of Bethel. He pitches his tent there. And again, he builds an altar there to call upon the, the name of the Lord. And he journeyed on and on. He's not trying to settle. He's actually, wherever he is going, building an altar is a, you know, he's, he's, he's a man of worship. And that's the difference we find quite significant in 11 and 12. The result there is blessing. And the striking thing, without perhaps going too far ahead of himself, is actually in 12. Here we get perhaps one of the very earliest promises of the Messiah. In you, the nations, all the nations of the earth, including all these nations that you know, seem to have been under God's curse, in you, that is in you, Abraham, through you, your descendant, the one who will be the blessing of all nations, will come. That is our Lord Jesus Christ. No wonder um, um, Matthew in his gospel will trace the genealogy of Jesus Christ all the way back to Abraham because this is the clearest place where we find the lineage of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see the big difference there? Man's initiative, our own initiative, our attempts at salvation, our attempts at saving ourselves, at making you know, a way to God, that, that's just religion. You know, our attempts at preserving our culture, we don't want to lose our identity. You know, wali wali kana dini zao rakini mwa Afrika ama mkikuyu die aingia kwa dini za wengine. The God of the Bible is indeed a centrifugal God. I passed into emphasize that point number four. He is a God for all people. Whereas the gods of the nations, that is idols, are almost here for us in dini yetu. A lot of world religions are not even evangelistic. Think of Hinduism. But, uh, it's one of the biggest uh, religions in the world. But it doesn't go out uh, to look for people to actually become. Because it's a tribal sort of or, or a national or ethnic kind of a deity. It doesn't reach out. It's not for all. You have to be Hindu. It's basically a culture. The God of the Bible transcends cultures, transcends human cultures. Because... God is a God of all people. He has appeared for all people so that everyone everywhere, he commands. We've just been read that passage. Everyone everywhere to repent of their sins. Let me move on to the next thing that I'd love to say. But if you forget everything else, remember those five points of differences between human religions and the God of the Bible. How do we know the God of the Bible? Well, he speaks. And this is a striking thing because Isaiah 44 Verses 9 to 20 is one of those very comical passages. I know we have preached on it before, I think in 2019. If you dig up our YouTube videos at Grace Point, you perhaps come across this very comical passage, Isaiah 44, when we were beginning the series uh, on idols. And you know, it talks about idols that do not speak, that are just carved out of wood. Um, Exodus 20, uh, verse 3 uh, tells us, you, you shall not worship. Um, we shall not bow down to idols. You know, what you know, these passages are doing, they acknowledge the existence of idols, but also warns us against them, warns us not to pay attention to them, because they are just things that we have built up within ourselves. 
They're just figments of our own imagination. There is no objective truth. There is no speech uh, that has actually come out of them. There's no way to assess uh, because they're just things that have actually been made up by human imagination and creativity. On the contrary, uh, God speaks. The God of the Bible speaks and he has spoken. He is not a tribe, communal or a national deity, but actually the creator of all the earth. And how has he created? By speaking. And God said, let there be, and there was. And he has spoken clearly and authoritatively in the pages of scripture. He has not left us without a witness. He has given us the amazing thing that distinguishes human beings from the rest of the created order, speech. We can communicate. You can relate because communication really is at the heart of all communication. So he is the living God who speaks, who you can relate to, who you can talk to, who he's not just quiet as you speak to him, but he actually also speaks and has spoken to us very clearly in the pages of scripture. He has revealed himself to our people so that he can be known by all nations. All who get to know or hear of him immediately have a mandate to go and tell others of him. Is that, uh, the next point, I, I can see uh, Ken is really rushing me through this, which is very good. He has revealed himself. In other words, he not only speaks, but he has also made himself obvious. He is not one in hiding. He has actually revealed himself. He has revealed himself in creation, as we spent quite a bit of time on that. Um, and uh, he has also revealed himself in scripture. You know, he is not one whom we have to grope about in darkness as if we are seeking, but he has spoken quite clearly and we can know him from the pages of scripture. And particularly the, third, the last point there is in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And this is where Jesus makes a very strong and exclusive claim that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. In other words, he is God who has come down to us. Like we said earlier, it's immanent. He has come down to us and made himself obvious. We have seen him. We have seen his glory of the one and only. Here is the Lamb of God, John announces in his gospel. Um, well, John the Baptist announces in John's gospel that here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's a strong claim for Jesus to make. And I'd love to put it to us this evening, listening to seekers and perhaps uh, uh, skeptics among us, and even believers who are in this uh, meeting tonight, that the gospel, that is the life, the work, the teaching, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ is an objective truth. Without missing any words, there's absolutely no doubt as to the fact that the gospel is an objective truth. How do we know that? Well, next point, um, uh, Ken, is we know this because of the historicity of Jesus Christ. It is not a figment of anyone's imagination that Jesus walked on this earth. It is indeed a historical fact. Any more than, you know, you could say, Julius Caesar was once the leader um, of the Roman people is a historical figure that walked on these earth. And throughout his life um, and the immediate years following, there was no disputation whatsoever about the fact that actually he walked on these earth. Uh, doubts and perhaps questions by uh, atheists and others who perhaps wanted to introduce alternative views are not really in the um, in the early years of, of, of the history of God's people, there has been no disputation whatsoever as to the historicity of the person of Jesus Christ. But also we can add that it's an objective truth because there's a witness of the gospel and of early witnesses. More than 500 people witnessed his resurrection. Thousands were impacted by his own teaching while he was here on earth. 
other writers who were perhaps not among his followers wrote and testified about his teaching. Certainly Josephus, uh, one of the earliest um, uh, uh, historians of the Jewish people wrote about Jesus Christ. He wasn't necessarily a follower of Jesus Christ, but he gives um, a witness to anyone who might be doubting as to the historicity of Jesus Christ, which is indeed itself an objective truth. We also know that it is true because many people, that point is that many people are willing to die for the sake of this truth. Many Christians were martyred because of this truth. Peter, Paul, uh, Bishop Polycarp, who at 86 years old had this to say that, you know, I have followed him for these 86 years and he has not done me any harm. And then he was thrown to the lions and he was willing to die. If surely this was a figment of anyone's imagination, no one would be willing to die for the sake of such um, a made up theory. And suddenly, without through the history of God's people, many people have laid their lives for the sake of this truth, including two African ladies, Perpetua and Felicitas. But we also know that this is objective truth because it could not be contained in any one culture. Many cultures have tried to domesticate the gospel and make it their own, or perhaps try to claim to it. But no culture has ever been able to um, sort of domesticate it and actually then try and export it. Oftentimes, those who have tried has been disastrous in its results and perhaps even ended up only as mere religion. The gospel is supracultural. And all human cultures, the American culture bows on the knee in the face of Jesus, the British culture, the Greco-Roman culture, the Persian culture, the Kikuyu culture, all our cultures and our religions are all fallen. But the gospel transcends all cultures. And every culture needs to bow at the face of Jesus Christ. But also finally, the gospel is an objective truth because of its transforming power across ages and nations. The testimonies of changed lives, both among us who are here tonight, and of many other believers, we can see the transforming power of the gospel in nations where Jesus has been proclaimed. Social justice has been uh, witnessed. Uh, certainly there are many who would say that perhaps some have used the gospel for their own ends. That would also be true. But the transforming power of the gospel in its purest sense cannot be denied either. Surely the presence of the gospel, even in our own country, can be traced even in your own family and in your own village. I was just uh, meeting up with a man this morning who said the power of the gospel in his own family is evident. That those who came to Christ years, uh, earlier, in the earlier years, there has been real transformation. It's actually evident. And that has served as a witness. Christians have stood for justice. Whereas human cultures have moved away, tried to kill children, Christians have stood for that which is true and that which is right. In ages of oppression, Christians have stood for the dignity of human life uh, on many, many occasions. Brothers, I need to bring this, and sisters, I need to bring this to an end. And I trust that we've been able to be persuaded. That I'm not just trying to push for a culture. This is not, like we said last week, this is not the British American culture. You know, this is not the um, sort of Greco-Roman. This is not uh, what you might call Judaic. Christian kind of culture, this is the gospel. It is not a culture we are pushing. It is not a religion. My own traditional religion would be very different. And I think it has to be called to know there's salvation nowhere else except in the name that has been given under heaven to all mankind by which we must be saved. And that name is Jesus Christ. So are all religions really Paths up a mountain? No, it is not a mountain we are climbing. On the contrary, really, it is a God who has come down to us. We're not trying to climb a mountain. It's actually a God who has come. And he doesn't dwell in mountains. No, he has actually come down to exactly where we are. And his good news is that we can come to a fellowship and to a living faith in him. He is not far away from you. 
He is not an abstraction, an idea out there that you have to grow and try and discover. He has spoken. He has revealed himself to you. And what is challenging you tonight, who might be among us, and maybe you're not a believer, is that quit those Babel projects. Quit building a tower for yourself. You know, quit those man-made projects. Try to seek a name or try and preserve your culture and your tribal identity. Listen to the God who says, go. Listen to the one who invites you to himself, who has actually come for you. He came that you may have life and that you may have it abundantly. May the Lord bless us tonight.